purpose of electing laureates of the Lincoln Academy is to reflect a tiny bit of honor back onto those who have reflected great honor on us by their service to mankind and their association, native born or acquired, with this magnificent state and its great people. With those words, Governor James Thompson marked the 16th convocation for the Lincoln Academy, May 9th, 1981. The chamber of the House of Representatives of the Illinois General Assembly at the state capitol in Springfield. The processional by the regents, trustees, and laureates of the Lincoln Academy. As Chancellor of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, it is now my privilege to convene the Academy's 1981 convocation. And after the invocation, presentation of the Order of Lincoln to five distinguished sons of Illinois. Presiding is Chancellor Marshall Berman. We now come to one of the, if not the, dramatic highlights of this ceremony the recognition of five Illinoisans who, by reason of their substantial contribution to the general welfare, have been selected by the Academy's regions as laureates of the Lincoln Academy, and as such, to be honored by the governor of the state of Illinois with the decoration of the Order of Lincoln. As to the first of these laureates, I would like to call upon the President of the Academy, Governor Thompson, to read a message. Governor. Thank you, Mr. Chancellor. I have a message tonight from the White House. Dear friends, Nancy and I are delighted to extend our greetings as you gather for this special evening. We both are so sorry that we cannot be with you for the Lincoln Academy of Illinois' convocation and the investiture of laureates, the governor's reception, and the dinner and ball. But we want you to know that we are thinking about you tonight. I'm very proud to be one of the five you are honoring with the Order of Lincoln Medal, and I will do everything in my power to live up to this trust that you have placed in me. Nancy and I send our congratulations to the other medalists Thomas G. Ayers, Dr. James W. Cronin, John T. Trotter, and former Senator Adlai Stevenson. With warm personal regard and every wish for a very successful evening, Ronald Reagan, President of the United States.
I will now ask that the first of our laureates who are present tonight, Mr. Thomas G. Ayers, join the governor and myself at this podium. I will ask that the citation to Mr. Ayers be read by a regent of our academy, Mrs. Elizabeth Ballot. Born in Detroit, Michigan, educated at the University of Michigan, Thomas G. Ayers joined Commonwealth Edison Company in 1938 and spent his entire career there. Between 1964 and 1980, he served as president or chairman and chief executive officer of Edison, the largest single operating electric utility in the nation. In industry circles, he has developed a reputation as a forward thinker. He has been named chairman of the Breeder Reactor Corporation, whose purpose is to develop an energy technology which will carry us well into the 21st century. In 1977, he was also named Electric Industry Man of the Year. Mr. Ayers has shown leadership in numerous civic activities, and his achievements are considerable. During the 60s and early 70s, when racial tensions in Chicago were at their peak, he served as the bridge between the minority community and the civic and business community. He was instrumental in developing the Leadership Council, the Chicago Economic Commission, and Dearborn Park, a project designed to revitalize the near south side of Chicago. In 1973, the Chicago Urban League named him Man of the Year. Additionally, Mr. Ayers has served as chairman of the Metropolitan Crusade of Mercy and president of the Chicago Association of Commerce and Industry. For the last 15 years, he has been chairman of the board of trustees of Northwestern University and is presently chairman of the board of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra. Today, he is as active and forward-looking as ever. With characteristic enthusiasm, he has recently accepted responsibility for being president of the Chicago World's Fair in 1992. Time and again, Mr. Ayers has shown his dedication to the community. He is a selfless individual who has consistently worked without any thought for personal recognition. It is time now for Illinois to recognize one of its outstanding citizens. <coughs> Governor Thompson, I am honored to present to you Thomas G. Ayers to receive the Order of Lincoln and to become a laureate of the Lincoln Academy. Thank you. I'm honored to be a laureate of the Lincoln Academy. Several years ago, a book entitled The Territorial Imperative was on the bestseller list for better than a year. Anthropologist Robert Ardrey, the author, tells us that the territorial imperative is a deeply rooted concept perhaps an instinctive phenomenon that exists in birds, animals, and man. In its simplest definition, it is the overwhelming passion to protect and maintain the integrity of a particular parcel of land. I like to think we have our own version of this here in Illinois. Each of us not only anxious to protect and maintain the status of our state, but to improve upon its well-being and the well-being of its people. That's what the Lincoln Academy is all about, and I'm proud to have received this recognition. Thank you. Will Dr. James W. Cronin approach the podium? Governor Thompson, it is my pleasure to call upon Mrs. Judy Bartoff, a trustee of the Academy, to read the citation to Dr. Cronin. James W. Cronin is co-winner of the 1980 Nobel Prize for Physics. The prize was awarded to Dr. Cronin and Dr. Val L. Fitch of Princeton University for discoveries concerning 
the symmetry of subatomic particles. Born in Chicago, James Cronin received his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1955. After seven years as professor of physics at Princeton University, Dr. Cronin returned to the University of Chicago in 1971 to assume the duties of a university professor of physics. He is a member of both the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and is recipient of both the John Price Weatherhill Medal of the Franklin Institute in 1975 and the Ernest O. Lawrence Award in 1977. Governor Thompson, I now present to you to receive the Order of Lincoln and thereby become a laureate in the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, Dr. James W. Cronin. Physics professors are not uh, accustomed to making remarks, so let me just tell you what's running through my mind at the moment. Uh, when one wins this, uh, this uh, Swedish award, of course, many people suddenly are very interested in you and uh, for various reasons. But the thing that I believe of all the things that has come to me that I'm most proud is the award of the uh, Lincoln Academy. I think it makes me feel more than ever a part, not only of this great nation, but in particular a part of uh, Illinois. As one drives down to Springfield on this rainy day, you can see the richness of the soil, and you really feel that this is, in fact, the essence of this country. Let me add one other remark. I don't think that the East and West Coasts have a monopoly on quality of education. We have a marvelous system of education here, and I accept this prize also on behalf of a great research university private university, University of Chicago. Thank you. Will the Honorable Adley E. Stevenson kindly approach the podium? Governor Thompson, it is my pleasure to call upon Richard Dunn, a regent of our academy, to read the citation to Senator Stevenson. Born in Chicago, Illinois, law and the political system were instilled in Senator Stevenson from childhood. There was the tutelage and the example of his father, the heritage of his grandfather and great-grandfather. He took his undergraduate education at Harvard University and upon completion entered the military service, serving in Korea. During the Korean War and attaining the rank of captain in the United States Marine Corps, he returned to Harvard University, received his legal degree, and was admitted to practice law in the state of Illinois in 1957 when he joined the firm now known as Mayor Brown and Platt. In 1964, he embarked upon a political career by serving as a member of the Illinois House of Representatives. He was elected state treasurer in 1966 and served with distinction in that capacity until elected to the United States Senate in 1970. Throughout his tenure in the Senate, Adlai Stevenson served the people of Illinois and of the nation with undivided loyalty. He is now elected to give up that office, return to private life and the law practice in Washington, D.C. Governor Thompson, I now present to you to receive the Order of Lincoln and become a laureate of the Lincoln Academy, Senator Adlai Ewing Stevenson III. Governor Thompson, who I 
thank for exercising that restraint when he had his hands around my neck. <laughs> General Dunn, Chancellor Berman, my fellow laureates and a distinguished guests. It has been honor enough for me to serve Illinois in several public offices, including once in this venerable chamber. I am all the more grateful for this honor and express my deep gratitude to you, Chancellor Berman, to the regents and the trustees of the Lincoln Academy. People came to Illinois from Africa and the old world. They came from the east and then from the south. They came to wards along the Chicago River, cotton fields in Little Egypt. Millions of solitary individuals in their deeds and works overcame the harshest implications of our history. They built Illinois and quietly passed on generation after generation. They knew the possibilities for progress here in the heartland were limited only by human imagination and human will. They built on the foundation of their own sufferings and joys and hopes for us all. It is they who deserve the recognition. And from those of us who receive it, the chance to continue in a new era. I don't expect to seek election to public office in Illinois again, but I will continue serving the people of a state which has been good to my family for six generations. And in that service, I will also try to merit the Order of Lincoln. I now ask that John Trutter please come to the podium. Governor Thompson, the citation to Mr. Trutter will be read by Sally Schonbacher, a regent of the Academy. Born in Springfield, Illinois, and we do claim him. Educated at the University of Illinois, Northwestern University, and the University of Chicago, John T. Trutter is now Vice President for Community Affairs and Employee Information at Illinois Bell Telephone Company. He joined Illinois Bell in 1946 after graduation from the University of Illinois and four years of service as an Army officer in World War II, a Lieutenant Colonel. The list of civic and charitable organizations with which he is associated is long. There are over 30. Among those are Hull House, the National Conference of Christians and Jews, United Cerebral Palsy, Chicago United, the Lyric Opera, Boy Scouts of America. John was also a founder of the Sangamon County Historical Society. Even with his always busy schedule, he found time to write many articles and several books one of particular interest to all of us in 1977, published by the State Historical Society, which he and his wife co-authored, was called The Governor Takes a Bride, a story of the Tanner years. Many people wrote letters and had kind things to say about John Trutter when they heard he was a candidate for this award. But one of my favorites, came from a close friend of John's, unable to be here at this time, Judge Harlington Wood, Jr. He said, I regret that John chose a career in private business rather than in government, where men like him are always needed. Wherever he has been, he has always made unusual and substantial contributions to public welfare. Few people that I know have devoted as much of their personal lives for unselfish purposes. Governor, it is my pleasure to present this most deserving candidate, John Thomas Strutter, 
to receive the Order of Lincoln and to become a laureate in the Lincoln Academy of Illinois. Thank you, Governor Thompson, Chancellor Berman, and dear friend Sally Schoenbacher. There's an old uh, military adage, particularly for recruits, that goes like this, never volunteer. I missed that session somewhere along the line, but I've long felt that volunteer service is a basic personal responsibility, particularly with the increasing complexities of our society and the great needs that many people have. The more we share the blessings of good fortune, the greater the obligations. As Sally mentioned, some years ago, I had the experience of heading the Hull House Association, a pioneer Illinois agency that has grown to a social conglomerate of some 25 settlement houses. The first Hull House president, as you all know, was Nobel laureate Jane Addams, who once said, the good we secure for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secured for all of us and is incorporated into our common life. And Jane Addams also stated, the philanthropist, the sociologist, and the good citizen cannot ever hope to steadily march forward because, after all, the best things of this world do not march forward, but go zigzagging along as they best may. And if one is fortunate, after a while, it is found that advance rather than retrogression has been made. Well, my zigzagging has flatteringly been recognized by this renowned academy, and I greatly appreciate the honor. I should have a litany of thanks to express to many, and I do have that inside of me, but I'll spare you that ritual. However, I've been fortunate to operate in a very supportive corporate environment and with a tolerant family. And one way I handled the tolerant family was to get them involved in the same activities. You might call that nepotistic philanthropy. Uh, one more thought. Some people at both ends of the economic spectrum belittle the term charity work. I would remind them that charity is a French-derived word for love. And that may be a philological nicety, but I think it's high time to make those two words interchangeable. Thank you for this cherished award and the memorable evening. It's now my privilege to call upon a man who has really been elected by the overwhelming voice of the people of our state Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, the president of the Lincoln Academy, and the 39th governor of the state of Illinois, the Honorable James R. Thompson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Governor Walker, Governor Stratton, Senator Stevenson, Mr. Chancellor, Regents and Trustees and members, and friends of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois. The purpose of electing laureates of the Lincoln Academy is to reflect a tiny bit of honor back onto those who have reflected great honor on us by their service to mankind and their association, native-born or acquired, with this magnificent state and its great people. John Trotter should not feel badly that he has spent his life in the private sector doing good works. There needs to be constant bridges built between the private sector and government service. As we all are aware, government cannot do it all. Government should not attempt to do it all. Limitations of power, limitations of common sense, 
limitations of the essential ethic of the American people and limitations of the purse prevent government at any level from attempting to, to define and solve all our problems. And bridges like John are those that we must be building every day. Tom Ayers has gone back and forth, for he has held public as well as private office. And those bridges must be built as well. The spans of those bridges reach a little longer because he has seen service on both sides. But the point is essentially the same. Government and its people privately represented must come together at many more points. Dr. Cronin confounds us, at least he confounds all non-physicists in this audience. He certainly confounds me. I didn't even understand the citation let alone what it was that he did to achieve the Nobel Prize. But I know what it was he did to be elected a laureate of the Lincoln Academy. A rare genius who comes from a long line of rare geniuses, citizens of Illinois, all. The length and breadth of this great state, the sons and daughters of the rich soil, that he saw as he drove to Springfield on a wet and rainy afternoon. President Reagan and Senator Stevenson have made the ultimate sacrifice. They have entrusted their fortunes to the people of Illinois and the people of the United States. The trust and confidence of those same people have been reposed in them in high public office, where one now serves and one has served with diligence, with rare fidelity, with principle, integrity, with honor. All those virtues that we assume in private life, all those virtues that I think we hope for in public life. All those virtues that I think we too often fail to recognize because we don't look hard enough and understand wisely enough. Illinois is proud of both of its native sons, our distinguished president, our distinguished former senator. All of these laureates tonight in combination represent the best of our state. Illinois and other places were the home of the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates. And in the opening speech of those debates delivered in Springfield, this city, in the year 1858, President Lincoln said it, I think, much more succinctly than I. He concluded his remarks by saying, our cause, then, must be entrusted to and conducted by its own undoubted friends, those whose hands are free, whose hearts are in the work, who do care for the result. Mr. Chancellor, members of this academy, I suggest to you that by your wisdom and your discretion, you have honored tonight laureates whose hands are free, whose hearts are in the work, who do care for the results, their service of the past, their present service, and their undoubted service of the future, not only will reflect gloriously and honorably upon our state and its people, but I know will materially advance the cause of our nation. And I am proud to present them the medals of the Lincoln Academy. Thank you very much.
Thank you all for attending the 1981 convocation, and we'll see you at the ball. The audience honoring the 1980 laureates was the largest ever, numbering more than 650 people from 55 counties in Illinois. From the House chamber, they adjourned to Sangamon State University, where a hall of laureates had been set up with pictures of the 108 sons and daughters of Illinois honored during the 16-year history of the Lincoln Academy. Friends, family, and guests had an opportunity to congratulate the laureates personally in a receiving line headed by Governor Thompson and his wife, Jane. And then they all sat down to dinner, a festive occasion, hearkening back to one of the pleasures of the man whose name the Academy bears. For Abraham Lincoln loved a party. He co-sponsored a cotillion in Springfield, met his wife at a dance, and his second inaugural ball was described as a very handsome affair. But Lincoln rarely knew in his lifetime the appreciation of his fellow citizens for the qualities that, after his death, have brought us to honor his memory. And the Lincoln Academy has sought to change that in the years since 1965 when it was established. And so each year it honors, during their lifetimes, people who have made great contributions, demonstrated that special genius for leadership and achievement. People of whom Mr. Lincoln would have been proud. <laughs>